Hello everyone. Herpes simplex, the same virus that causes cold sores, is the most common cause of sporadic encephalitis worldwide. It's so common that whenever we see a patient with possible encephalitis and we don't know the cause, which we usually don't right away, we start empiric therapy for herpes simplex because early treatment is paramount. And if there is one good thing about this virus is that it's one of the few causes of viral encephalitis that is actually treatable. So let's see how we can suspect and diagnose herpes simplex encephalitis. The hallmark of any kind of encephalitis is brain dysfunction and herpes simplex 1 specifically has a high affinity for the temporal lobe. So if you take your neurology textbook and look at the structures situated in the temporal lobe and you take a look at their function, it will be much easier to understand the clinical presentation of herpes simplex encephalitis. Patients will usually present with a speech impairment, so dysphagia or aphasia, memory problems, disorientation, cognitive impairment and behavioral changes. Usually it's the family members who notice that something is off because the onset of symptoms in herpes simplex encephalitis is gradual. It usually develops over the course of many hours or days. So they'll say things like, uh, mom has been acting all weird in the last couple of days. She keeps asking us the same question over and over again. She got lost in her own house or uh, she keeps looking for the car keys in the kitchen and she knows full well that the car keys are never in the kitchen, right? She says things that don't make sense. She can't remember what happened 10 minutes ago. This is how it starts. The patients are often disoriented or drowsy, inattentive or agitated. They become angry over nothing. Without treatment, the patient's state of consciousness will further deteriorate over the next few days and many patients will eventually develop seizures or an obvious focal neurologic deficit like hemiparesis or aphasia. Another thing I would like to point out here is this gradual onset of symptoms and this is what sets encephalitis apart from stroke for example because if you work in the emergency department and you see a patient with hemiparesis of a recent seizure you will automatically suspect a vascular accident a stroke and here is where history is key you have to ask their family members caretakers whoever how did this start and if you see this gradual onset you have to suspect that it might not be a vascular accident after all, especially if other signs of infection were present. And this is another tricky part about encephalitis. As opposed to patients with bacterial meningitis, these patients are not septic. Their fever might not be all that impressive. They might not even notice that they have a fever. That is until they come to the emergency department and then we notice that their temperature is abnormally high. The patient's headache also doesn't have to be all that impressive. As I stated in my previous lectures on central nervous system infections, herpes simplex has a strong propensity to infect the brain, not the meninges. And it's the meninges that hurt in meningitis, meningoencephalitis. Patients with pure encephalitis may not have a very impressive headache. Many do have a headache, but forget about neck stiffness, forget about all the meningeal signs. No, you will not find that. So this is another thing that makes it difficult for clinicians to suspect a central nervous system infection. And when you put all of this together, it's easy to understand why many patients with encephalitis are misdiagnosed as having a stroke or dementia, right? And this is why I always point out Medical history is key. If you have a patient with this gradual onset of brain dysfunction over the course of several hours or days, you have to suspect encephalitis. Even if, even if they don't have a high fever, even if they don't have a very impressive headache. So, what kind of diagnostic tests can you use to figure this out to make the diagnosis? Well, most patients in emergency departments with such symptoms will get a head CT scan and in encephalitis, usually the CT scan will come back normal. MRI is much more sensitive for any kind of encephalitis, basically, especially herpes simplex encephalitis. And on the MRI, you should see abnormalities in the temporal lobe. But let's be honest, how many patients get an urgent MRI in the emergency department? This is highly unlikely, right? So imaging will not help you much. It will help you in the sense that you will see that there are no signs of vascular accident and then 
hopefully you will suspect that it is something else like encephalitis. The only way to reliably diagnose or exclude encephalitis is to perform a lumbar puncture with CSF analysis, if there are no contraindications, of course. In the CSF, in herpes simplex encephalitis, you will typically see an elevated white blood cell count, maybe a few dozens or hundreds of cells, most of which will be lymphocytes, not neutrophils. In addition to that, you will see a mildly or moderately elevated protein concentration and normal glucose. So this is typical. If you see that glucose is abnormally low, this is still a central nervous system infection, but it's highly unlikely that it's viral. It's highly unlikely that it's herpes simplex. You have to suspect other causes. More on that in my other videos on central nervous system infections. So elevated white blood cell count, lymphocytes, mildly or moderately elevated protein, normal glucose. So how do you prove that this is herpes simplex? You will typically send a sample of the CSF for PCR, herpes simplex PCR. This test is highly sensitive and highly specific, almost 100%. But I emphasize almost. Sometimes in the first couple of days, it could come back falsely negative, especially if the sample is contaminated with blood. Blood can interfere with the test. So if the symptoms fit, if the findings on the MRI fit, but the first PCR is negative, you should continue treating this patient with a cyclovir and then repeat the test in three to five days. I emphasize this because this is the question I often get when you have a patient with encephalitis, you don't know the cause and you start empiric acyclovir for herpes simplex, but then herpes simplex PCR comes back negative, is it safe to discontinue acyclovir? So if the second PCR is negative, this does make herpes simplex highly unlikely and you should look for other causes of encephalitis. But keep in mind that even this does not exclude it with 100% certainty. So if the clinical presentation and imaging findings just scream herpes simplex, you should continue a cyclovir and when in doubt, of course, consult your friendly neighborhood infectious disease specialist. I included several research articles in the description of this video where you can find a more detailed explanation. Regarding acyclovir, make sure that you use the correct dosage. So for adults with normal kidney function, the proper dose is 10 mg per kilogram three times a day for 21 days of treatment. Always remember that early treatment is associated with much better survival and a better neurologic outcome, and it's absolutely paramount. If you learned something useful here, please share this video with your colleagues and students. And if you want to learn how to recognize serious infections as early as possible, I highly recommend you take a look at my free online course for clinicians. You will learn about central nervous system infections, sepsis, complications of common infections, all of these things, these don't miss diagnosis that you can encounter in your daily practice. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.